Hello, welcome to this session on how multigrade oil works. It actually supports my last video on multigrade oils explained, but I'm going to go in in a little more detail on this session on the molecular changes on how the oil changes with temperature from a low viscosity to a high viscosity. So if you stay tuned, hopefully I can demystify any myths or uncertainties you may have regarding multigrade oil. So let's get stuck in. Here I've got a cross-sectional view, or an inside view if you like, of a four-stroke engine. Now it is only a very basic model, and I've done that purposely, just so I can explain my point. And I do realise that the type of engine that would require a multigrade oil is most likely to be a bigger engine with multiple pistons. I'm only showing a single cylinder piston engine here, just to explain my point as I've said. OK, from here, I'll explain my way through. I'll follow the oil channels through. But first of all, what I will need to do is just put some oil in the sump. There we go. It's there. Now, let's imagine this engine is cold. So the oil at the bottom here is cold. And as we know with oil, just like treacle or something like that, the colder it gets, the thicker it gets. So let's imagine this is a basic oil, a basic single grade oil, and because it's cold, it's as thick as it will get. Now that's fine at the moment, no issues here. But when the engine starts from a cold start, we've got to get that very thick oil up to all the components as quick as we possibly can. So the engine's running now, and this oil at the bottom here is thick. Although it doesn't take too long for the oil to get round, there is insufficient lubrication in these areas, the cylinder here and the mains area, and up at the top where the rockers are, they all need lubricating. And it can take the oil pump here up to 90 seconds to pump all the oil up through all the oilways and into the areas of the engine that need the lubrication. I know this doesn't sound long, but it's long enough for two metal surfaces to be rubbing together without any lubrication at all. Before we're up to lubricating efficiency, the oil actually has to go a long way. Now let's have a look at what it has to do in a matter of seconds. So again, let's imagine the engine's just started and the oil pump's now working and it's drawn in sump oil from here through the suction strainer and into the pickup pipe. Then it goes through the pump and into the filter, through the filtration system, out of the filter. Then it goes down this oil way to the main bearings. Then it continues up the oil way and then out through like a sprayer under the piston to lubricate the piston as it goes up and down the bore. Then it's up to the top here where it lubricates the rocker arms and the camshaft. But arguably, the most important area for lubrication on an engine, and certainly the area that takes most of the load, is the big end bearing. So where the conrod here fixes onto the crankshaft on the big end area, let's take another look at that from another point of view. Let's turn it round so we can see. Let's just remove the engine so we can see things a little clearer. And it's this area here, the big end bearing, we're going to take a look at. When oil was fed to the main bearings, as I showed a moment ago, a special oil gallery exists here and allows the oil to flow through inside a special oil way through the center of that crankshaft, allowing it to go and feed the big end bearing. So we'll take this area of interest and we'll zoom in and we'll take a look at the cross-sectional view of the bearing from this angle. So there we go, the cross-sectional view. We've got the conrod here going up to the piston and we've got the end cap here. And in the center here is the main big end journal part of the crankshaft. So all of it is the big end bearing. And as I've just mentioned about the lubrication of this big end bearing, that's done so through this hole here, through the center of this big end journal. And you can see there another oilway coming off that, which goes out into the area there where the conrod meets the journal. Now you'll notice there that the main journal is not sitting central inside the big end area. And I've drawn it this way just to emphasize a point. That is that although these seem very, very tight clearances between the big end journal and the conrod, there is a slight gap on all of them. As I've said, although they are very tight clearances and when there's no sufficient lubrication coming up to the big end bearing, there's going to be metal to metal contact. So when we first start that engine and it's running, it's going to be up to 90 seconds, as I said earlier, where we haven't got sufficient lubrication coming up to this area, allowing the metal to metal contact to create a certain amount of wear. But let's have a look what happens when we do get oil up into this area. 
This is the oil way here, the one that feeds the big end, the one I showed here, the one that comes through the crank, and it travels up the oil way this way because the pump's now working, creating flow, and there is some pressure there because of the thickness of the oil way. It's quite restrictive, so it's creating pressure. So the pump's creating the flow, and the restriction of these oil ways are creating some pressure, and the oil flows up out of the oil way on the big end journal there, and it fills up this area here. It basically fills that space between the big end journal and the conrod. So filling that clearance between the two. And because it's got good flow from the pump and good pressure from the restrictions I mentioned, it forces its way right round the journal. And what that's now done is centralised that big end journal there within the centre of the whole big end bearing itself. And that means there's now a film of oil all the way round that journal separating it so there's no metal to metal contact between the journal and the big end bearing itself. So that's what we now call lubricated. So now we know the process of getting this lubricated and the consequence of not doing. We need to know now that we can get that oil up into the big end bearing as quickly as we possibly can. So before we go any further I need to be clear about the oil's viscosity. This, of course, will relate to how quickly we can get the oil up there. So let's just take a look at this chart I've made here on viscosity. And I'm sure you'll agree it's a very simple chart. And all it's saying is when an oil is in low viscosity, it's thin. And when it's at a high viscosity, it's thick. Very simple. And I just want to make it clear how temperature affects viscosity. So we'll put this little temperature scale here. As I explained earlier, like with syrup, when syrup's cold, it's thicker and it's got a higher viscosity. And if we're talking about a very basic single grade engine oil, we've got pretty much the same issue there. When it's cold, it's thicker and it's got a higher viscosity, of course. And when we add some heat, so when the oil's nice and hot, it becomes thinner and that means it's got a low viscosity. Let's just recap then the critically important job of engine oil when we come to cold starting. And that is, obviously, when it's cold, it's thicker. But that means it's still got to get up to all these important parts of the engine in order for the engine to have reduced wear. And it's this very reason why we must choose the right engine oil for our engines. As soon as we turn the key from the cold start, we need to try and achieve this level of lubrication as quickly as we possibly can. But the reality is we're going to get this issue for the first few seconds. But when the engine's been running for a little while, it of course starts to get warmer. And also the engine oil inside there starts to get warmer and when it gets warmer it starts to get thinner and that makes it more efficient in lubricating all those areas of the engine that need to be reached by the oil. And just how efficiently the oil can deal with heat and cold depends on the grade of oil and the type of oil if you like. That's why it's very important we know the type of oil we're looking for and we know what the codes mean on the side of the oil cans when we buy them so we know what grade we're buying. This particular oil says SAE30 on the side of the can so let's have a look what that means. Well first of all we refer to this type of oil as single grade and that will become apparent in a moment but for now let's break this code down. If we look at it in two parts, the first part being all the letters and then the second part being all the numbers. And if we take a look at each set of codes, we can decipher exactly the grade of oil we've got. So let's take that code and we'll break it down. So it basically means the Society of Automotive Engineers. That's what SAE stands for. And it says that because it is the Society of Automotive Engineers that measure these oils, measures their viscosity and comes up with a number relating to their viscosity. And that number follows here. So according to the Society of Automotive Engineers, this has a viscosity of 30. So rather than this oil being too thin or too thick, it's kind of a mid-range sort of oil in terms of viscosity. Now to explain that a little better, I'll put some SAE numbers on this chart so we know where we stand. The higher the number, the higher the viscosity, so the thicker the oil, and therefore the lower the number, the lower the viscosity of the oil, so the thinner the oil. Now our oil is an SAE30, so ours would be mid-range on this chart. Now we'll just continue and fill up the rest of the chart here. So we've established that our SAE30 sits here, and an SAE50 would sit here, and of course an SAE10 here, and a 40 here, etc. 
Now explaining this in a little more detail than I did in my previous video, it's important to mention, as determined by the Society of Automotive Engineers, that this oil, if we're talking about SE30, is a 30 grade viscosity when cold, and even when it's got hot and the viscosity is lost slightly through the heat, it's still determined as a 30 grade oil. So in essence then, even when an oil gets cold and gets thick, and even when it gets hot and gets thin, if it's been graded at a certain grade, in this case SA30, then that's how the Society of Automotive Engineers has determined that an SA30 will react to hot and cold. They know that this is the nature of this particular oil and how the molecular changes occur, making it thin and thick regarding hot and cold. The thing to remember is the thicker an oil is to begin with, then the less it's going to go down that viscosity chart towards thin when it gets hot. And that leads me on to my next point. This is why we can't just use a thin oil to begin with. Remember when I said earlier that we need a thin oil to get up to those bearings and all those areas to lubricate the engine as quick as we possibly can and that from a cold start the oil's thicker so we need to wait for it to warm up in order to get thin enough to get to those components if not those components are going to be lacking in oil but using a low viscosity oil to begin with will only result in a lower viscosity when things heat up and whilst that supplies a speedy delivery of oil to all those areas in the engine it's actually detrimental to certain areas and mainly the big end bearing and that's because what we're trying to achieve with the big end bearing as we went through earlier is that nice film of oil that's vital there between the main crank journal and the outer big end bearing bit on the conrod itself. And the only way it can do that is to be of a certain thickness. So have a certain film strength, if you like, in order to stay in there and lubricate. And the problem we'll get if the oil is too thin is that the oil will drop out too quickly and it won't lubricate between those two metal surfaces and it will cause wear. So what we find is that it's a trade-off between needing an oil that is of a low viscosity, so a low SAE number, in order to go up and feed all those areas of the oil from the moment we turn the key when it's cold, and the need for a thicker oil with a higher SAE number in order to keep that film strength inside the bearing there and keep the lubrication there. That's why the subject of oil and lubrication isn't really a simple one, and another reason why it's vital that we stick to manufacturers' recommendations for oils. But the question is, how can we give fast lubrication there from a cold start and good lubrication there when it's hot? Well, this is where our clever multi-grade oils come in. These are very cleverly synthesized oils that allow us efficient lubrication from cold right through to warm and right through to hot. Most car engines nowadays, of course, do use multi-grade oil. And looking at the side of a container containing multi-grade oil will show us that the codes on them contain numbers and a letter. In this case, it's 5W30. So let's have a look what them codes mean. And I've chose 5W30 here randomly, but it will apply to all other codes. Now, as we can see with this code, it consists of two parts. The first being the 5W. The 5W means that this oil has a viscosity of SAE5 at the moment. And this number five comes with the W and that's normally referred to as winter. Now there is some debate saying it should be weight etc but most of the literature out there if you do some research says winter. So we associate winter with being cold. So the SAE5 is in its five SAE viscosity when it's cold. And that's what that means. And that's very good news because as we've said, when we turn that key from a cold start, we want all that oil to get to all these areas as quick as we possibly can to reduce any engine wear. And that allows us to get that vital film of oil between that big end bearing there. Now, of course, nothing new here. We've been through this where a thinner oil gets to those engine components quicker. And when it gets hotter, it starts to fall out of those vital areas because it gets even thinner than that because of the heat. So we know that already. It lacks that vital film strength. The difference with the multigrade oil is that it changes viscosity. And that's now where the 30 comes in, in our 5W30. And when the engine and the oil gets hot, it acts like an SAE30. And that's where this 30 comes in, in the 5W30. 
30. I do emphasize that it acts like a 30. It doesn't actually become a 30. And I'm going to explain what happens to allow this in more detail in a little while. So please keep watching. And that's good news because now it's acting like a 30 when we're at high RPM and the engine and the oil's hot, it will keep that film strength load in there inside the main big end journals, as well as all the other vital areas. So now it's acting like an SAE 30. And remember what we said about SAE 30, as with any oil, if the oil gets really, really hot, it does lose some viscosity away from its SAE number, but it does act like a 30 just like an SAE 30 standing alone would. And I know that sounds a little complicated, but it's an SAE 5 in the cold, and then when it warms up, it goes to an SAE 30. And then to say that it loses some viscosity when it gets hot after that, it seems complicated. But what I'm trying to say is, it's the heat that changes the chemical composition of the oil to allow it to raise to an SAE 30 thickness, but then when it's acting like a 30 thickness, it actually acts like a standalone 30. And that in itself will lose some viscosity back after. And I'll explain a little better in a moment on the molecular side of things, why this happens. And it just might help to clarify matters. So the question is, what is this oil then? Is it made of a 5 or is it made of a 30? Or is it a mishmash of the two? Well, that's where the first number comes in. This number here, the five in this case, relates to the base oil. So that's relating to what the oil actually is. It's an SAE 5. But we said that this oil reaches the thicker viscosity of SAE 30. And the question is, how can it do that if the base oil is only an SAE 5? Well, the way it can do this is by using viscosity modifiers. And these are added to multigrade oils. And it's these viscosity modifiers that are responsible for the unique changes in viscosity of multigrade oils. And to best explain the relationship between these viscosity modifiers and the multigrade oil, we'll take a look at the constitution of the oil. So we'll pour some in now and we'll take a good look inside of it. There we go. Let's just imagine now we've got a container here and it's got this oil in it. And just so I can explain things a little better and we can see things a little better, let's look at the oil this way. And then it's added by another component and another component. In this oil, this multigrade oil, there is three main components. Now, I'm not saying that these are the only three components in oils. I'm simply saying that these three components are the important components I need to talk about in order to explain my point. OK, then. So this is a fluid and all those components in there are mixed together. So let's take a look at what those three components are. Firstly, of course, we've got the base oil. So we've got the SAE5. Then in with that, we've got the viscosity modifier. And finally, we have a solvent. So we have these three main components in this oil, and they all work together to create the changes in the oil's viscosity. And I'll explain how now. But firstly, in order to explain, let's bring the temperature chart back. So the SAE5 is the main base oil and it relates to when this oil's cold. And as things start to warm up, the viscosity modifier and the solvent act together with heat in order to produce a different viscosity. Let's look into how and why. But for now, let's just remove those molecules and imagine that the oil's still there. And I'll just put the viscosity chart in and I'll bring the temperature chart down here just so we can see things a little better and I can explain my point. So we know as common knowledge now that our 5W30 grade oil is actually an SAE5 with some special additives. So that means in the cold, it's an SAE5, it's quite thin. Now, instead of getting thinner in the presence of heat, like oil generally does, something different occurs now and the oil starts to act thicker. So although the base oil is an SAE5, it's no longer acting like an SAE5 in the presence of all this heat. It's now acting like an SAE30. And as I've mentioned, that's all down to these special viscosity modifiers and the solvent. So let's take a look at these two in more detail. Now, there are different types of viscosity modifiers and solvents with different grades and obviously different names. It's not my intention to list any of those. I just want to refer to them as viscosity modifiers and solvents just to keep things simple. 
So I'm going to focus in on these two now and we'll see how they react with each other. Well, first of all, let's look at the viscosity modifier. And the question is, what is a viscosity modifier and what's it made of? Well, its name speaks for itself and that's exactly what it does. It modifies the viscosity of the oil in the presence of heat. So it makes that oil thicker as we've gone through and that's all it does really. And the question is, what is it made of that allows it to thicken the oil the way it does extraordinarily? Well, if we could see this molecule through a very, very powerful microscope, we'd see that it's a long chain consisting of little subunits that are stuck together, that are bonded together in like a snake-like chain. And it's the all of these subunits and this whole chain that we call a polymer. And it's this polymer together, as we can see it now, that creates that molecule of that viscosity modifier. And as you can see from this image, that snake-like polymer is in quite a tightly coiled position at the moment. So it's all quite tightly packed together. And if we take a look on the outer perimeter of the whole molecule itself, we'll see that it's of a certain size at the moment. So that means, of course, that it would take up a certain amount of space within the oil. And what allows it to stay in this size and shape within the oil is the interactions between those little subunits within the polymer. If you can see there, we've got little bonds forming, little attractions, that is, even though they're opposite each other. And it creates this coiled effect, this overall coiled effect of the viscosity modifier molecule which gives a certain size overall, as I've mentioned. Remember that we said that because we've got a 5W30 grade oil here, that it's the first number that is the base oil. So that's the true thickness, if you like, the true viscosity of the oil, an SAE5. And within that SAE5 now, we've got these viscosity modifiers. And it's when the oil is cool that these viscosity modifiers have taken on a nicely packed coil shape because in the presence of cold temperatures, these bonds in the middle, these interactions are stronger. And of course, because they're stronger, it pulls in that polymer in that tightly packed position. So what about the solvent? Now the solvent is inside this oil, of course, with the viscosity modifiers, and it's floating around in there all mixed together. And this solvent interacts with the viscosity modifiers bonds. So it interacts with those bonds in the center that we've just been talking about. And in the presence of heat, this solvent weakens those bonds. So it weakens those interactions between those little subunits there. And because of this weakening of these bonds, there's less attraction there coiling that molecule together. And as a result, the molecule opens out like a coiled spring opening out it opens out and takes up more space notice on the temperature gauge there we're pointing towards hot and it's the solvent that's interacting with the temperature affecting these bonds as i've said which is the reason these bonds are weakening they don't actually become destroyed they're still there but they're just weakened enough to allow a certain amount of expansion for that polymer molecule now let's look at our base oil again. It's an SAE5 and at hot temperatures that should be really, really thin. But because of this expansion of millions of these viscosity modifier molecules, it takes up more space within the oil, even though it's only a thin 5, and it makes it feel like a 30. So it makes the oil much, much thicker. And when the oil cools back down again, and that solvent stops interacting with those bonds, those subunits start to interact tightly again, forming tight, strong bonds, and it coils the whole molecule up tightly again. And so many million of these viscosity modifier molecules have become tightly packed again, taking up less space, and that's why the oil can now take on the form again of its original SAE5 and be thinner in cold temperatures. And it's all thanks to the interaction of this solvent on this molecule in the presence of heat. And that pretty much concludes everything I've wanted to mention. I hope it's really been beneficial to you to watch this video. And I wanna thank you so much for watching. I wanna thank you, all those that are my subscribers. And just to leave you on the note that 
I've used 5W30, but it goes for all oils, the principle.